right, so welcome everybody to the um, bi-weekly lecture series in the Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell's uh, School of, Col sorry, College of Architecture, Art, and Planning. Before we get started, I would like to, to do the uh, land recognition. And today I would like to invite someone who's not me to do this. Is there anybody who would like to volunteer to do the land recognition today? Uh, sure, I'll go ahead and do it. All right, thanks, Alvin. No problem. Uh, Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayo Hono, uh, Gayo Gohono, uh, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayo Gohono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State in the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gayo Gohono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayo Gohono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Thanks so much, Aviana. All right, for the remainder of our semester's worth of lecture series, we have, you'll, you'll notice that there is no talk next Friday because it is the annual academic planning conference and many of the faculty and students will be um, occupied with that. However, the next week we will continue with the regional, the research seminar series with a talk by professors Eric Chu and Rachel Besner Kerr, both who are lead authors on the um, uh, IPCC reports about climate change. So they'll be engaging in a conversation about that. And um, there was a, a talk for the research seminar that had been scheduled, if you'll remember, for September 25th that we had to cancel, given that the uh, speaker was very much affected by the wildfires in California. That has now been rescheduled for December 2nd, which is a Tuesday. It will actually take place at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I recognize that that time may not work for many of you. We will be recording it, and I hope that many of you will be able to attend live or be able to watch the recording of that talk. All right, and without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Suzanne Charles, who will be introducing our guests. And then at the end, we will, after the presentation, we will have Q&A with our guests. It will go, the whole thing will run until about 11.45, so that those of you who wish to attend the other talk on Indigenous design and low-tech technologies will be able to do so without missing too much of the other one. Suzanne? Thank you, Linda. So today our speaker is Leslie Wu. Leslie is a respected leader with over 25 years of experience building sustainable communities and shaping urban growth in Canada's fastest growing urban region, Greater Toronto. Leslie, Leslie assumed the role of CEO at Civic Action in September 2020. Civic Action is a premier civic engagement organization that convenes established and rising leaders from all sectors, backgrounds, and experiences. Civic Action catalyzes actions and impactful solutions to address pressing challenges in Greater Toronto and the Hamilton area and beyond. Before joining Civic Action, Leslie was at Metrolinx for over a decade, including her time as Metrolinx's chief planning officer. Leslie has experience in the public, private, and not-for-profit sectors, as well as her experience as a planner, architect, and community activator. Leslie was named, named one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women in 2017 by WXN, spacing Toronto's transit, transit, wait, spacing Toronto's transit change maker in 2016, and Canada's Women's Infrastructure Network's 2015 Outstanding Leader. Leslie is the founder of SheBuildCities.org, and she uses her voice as a platform to amplify and platform to amplify and celebrate other women city builders. So, without further delay, Leslie Wu. Thank you. Ver I apologize. Oops. Sorry, That's Leslie. Okay. I forgot to do my main job, which was to say that today you are actually delivering the Bayer annual uh, lecture for honoring the late professor Glenn H. Bayer. And so um, this is sponsored, the talk today is sponsored by the Bayer Family Fund. And Professor Bayer taught in both the College of Architecture, Art and Planning 
and in the College of Human Ecology. He was one of the first professors of housing in the United States and um, went on to illustrious uh, positions at the national level and shaping housing policy at the national level be before becoming a professor here at Cornell in 1947. He was really before his time in his interest in issues related to sustainable design and environmentally sensitive planning. And so today's lecture really reflects the kind of forward thinking that was characteristic of Professor Beyer. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks, Linda. And uh, it is an honor to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And um, in many respects, I think if I was to retitle um, the presentation, I would call it uh, not so much the new normal or the new, it's really we're trying to, we're moving into hopefully a new not normal because the point is that what was normal before had, has, has had lots of, of issues and problems. Um, uh, I can't see the screen of uh, the slides. I don't know if that's deliberate. Thank you. Um, so, oops, I'll get going. So, uh, the first, um, if you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Before we begin to ask, um, what will the future look like? I think it's really important to kind of ask the question, why do cities even exist? Because I know there's a lot of conversation going on about right now with the lockdown and people are fleeing the city in cities in hordes and it's the rise of the suburbs. But I think let's just talk a little bit because I, uh, I am a strong believer that cities endure for quite a long time. Next slide. There's been points uh, in the recent time where we've, uh, there's been conversations about the fact that technology itself will no longer um, uh, warrant the importance of having urbanization continue and that cities and the notion of the clustering of all, all uh, what cities represent um, will be diminished or diluted by technology, but that's been proven not to be true. Next. At their essence, cities are really uh, a couple things. They're points of convergence. Uh, they were, uh, we all know that they're the, where trade, they, were, they became uh, elements for trade, but there's something we, uh, that we know about cities now more than ever. They are points of collision, which have fortuitously in many instances led to innovation. Um, they are uh, places of great opportunity and they're places of wealth creation. Next. So from as early as, um, you know, the earliest times of when uh, the notion of a city was formed, uh, the combination of the convergence of location and access through issues, uh, items like mobility have created in essence wealth. I think it's interesting that the lecture after this is going to talk about indigenous lens of cities because in indigenous, many indigenous cultures, wealth is not the marker of success in terms of, it's about how much wealth you give away, not, not necessarily how much wealth you retain. But we, uh, we, have, um, we are in living primarily in um, Western hemisphere and in most parts of Europe, in, in cities that are really the premise of which they exist is on the creation of wealth and then the access of others to wealth. Next. So that takes me to Toronto, which is where I'm sitting in right now. Uh, and I live right in the downtown, uh, right near where the city or actually with the origins of the city, it's a St. Lawrence Market where the original founding of the, the port uh, that was Toronto and what has now become one of the fastest growing in Canada, um, uh, just even prior to the pandemic, Toronto laid claim to the fact that it had the most number of cranes, 120 something cranes in the downtown core, this incredible increase in the number of multifamily um, residential uh, spaces and um, a thriving commercial. There was a huge um, uh, return to the downtown for commercial real estate and as such, has, uh, interestingly enough, uh, up until now, I would say, has continued to see that growth and interest in, in downtown living. Um, this, oops, yes, you can go to the next slide. So how did I, so a little bit about myself. Um, uh, this is actually, this is, a fa this is my family photo. This was taken a couple of years ago. Um, my family is, um, 
is one of the greatest um, examples of this, <laughs> the, the global diaspora. Um, we live in many different parts of the world, though the, the, there's three, um, el uh, I wouldn't call them elders, they won't like it if I said that, but the five siblings of um, my mother's uh, four siblings are all sitting in the front, the ones sitting in the front row, and all us other folks behind are, are the offspring, the um, you know, partners and kids and so forth. Uh, next slide. Uh, and a little bit about ourselves, uh, you can click on. Uh, my uh, family, uh, origin on my mother's side, uh, originated um, in northern China around Beijing. They migrated to the Caribbean in Trinidad, which is where I grew up, uh, when slavery was abolished and came to the Caribbean as indentured laborers. On my father's side, um, the, his father came to the Caribbean uh, during the Cultural Revolution. And that's how we found ourselves there. Next, if you just click one more. And then from there, uh, my mother's siblings uh, were the first in her family uh, to go to post-secondary education. An uncle who went to the UK to become a surgeon, another uncle who came to Canada to uh, study business, and one who also uh, went to, um, uh, pers uh, to pursue the, their education in the West Coast. Click one more. And then from there, still uh, further generations uh, set across. Uh, we have family in the Solomon Islands. Uh, we have family in Tokyo. I have family now in, you know, we have family in the so South America. Um, and so uh, a lot of who I am is represented by these multiple place, um, sort of places that we exist and, and um, uh, the, the makeup, how we've uh, decided where to be. And it's primarily around either leaving something, uh, in some cases my uncle who left um, Trinidad to go to Canada uh, after his education was because of, of uh, civil unrest in the, in the, on the island. But moreover, uh, for, like myself, came to, went to Canada for an education. Next slide. But we're not that unique and I, I don't have to necessarily tell a, gr a group that understands that's in the space of planning that by 2050 this is a UN chart um, showing the migration in a, in a diagram as from the 50s and what we forecast in the to the 2050s or 100 years we expect that about 70 percent of the world's population will be moving into cities and they're moving there from numerous numerous reasons uh, some are fleeing things but others are moving towards cities for the opportunity um, uh, uh, to make more of their lives next The great opportunities that cities present at the same time uh, already uh, we know are the places even before pandemic, even before where we are, have uh, really become places of a lot of fracture and friction. So that collision that I talked about earlier that has creating opportunity and innovation is also a collision that is also resulting uh, in different sort of uh, negative impacts. So 75% of the world's population are now uh, facing uh, live-in countries uh, where income inequality is continuing to grow. And Toronto is no different. Um, next. And not only is the collision in cities, but lots, you know, you can have a whole other lecture about how we got to where we are now. But even before that, 40% of the world's 195 nations were, were, we were witnessing some degree of social unrest. So all this is, these are, this is all data that pre precedes the pandemic. Next. And then of course, on issues of how urbanization is and, is, and how we are affecting uh, our climate, 70% of cities were already dealing with this issue. Okay, um, next slide. So think about it, this, this is the environment in which we have all been sitting, the kind of double-edged kind of notion of cities. And at the same time, as all this is happening, we experience what I refer to as three dramatic seismic shifts that has now compounded everything that preceded where we were in terms of the strengths and the kind of challenges in, in, in many major cities. One, um, the, the awakening 
to the deep pain and centuries of um, uh, issues of racism that we saw arose um, uh, in, Minia, in, in the US, but just the ripples that it has had across the rest of the world. So it's not only, uh, it's an interesting, and I'll talk about racism in Canada for a bit, but so that's one, I think that has been a seismic shift, um, a, a good shift uh, to, to, in the sense that it is uh, creating a critical mass around the issue. Uh, the second is our, in terms of we were already sliding into an economic decline before COVID hit. And so this, this is huge anxiety around how we're going to accelerate our ability to come out and recover economically. Um, I just wrote an op-ed in the Toronto Star newspaper that came out this morning. You know, the city of Toronto um, is facing a $1.5 billion deficit uh, or shortfall. Uh, that it will have to cover this year. And this is, it's compound, it was already in a not at the greatest state, but now overly compounded by both the economy and having to pay attention to COVID. And that brings you to the third major uh, shift, which is an interesting shift. It's like someone removed the velvet curtain that was sitting on top, a really ugly, ugly set. Um, the lockdown has been, uh, has affected uh, um, different parts of society disproportionately. And things that were there before, all those things I talked about before, are now laid bare in front of all of us, um, uh, um, forcing society to really uh, come to terms with uh, these big crevices in, in our social makeup. Next. So the turbulence is been difficult on so many fronts. People have lost jobs. There are growing challenges around mental health. Um, uh, there is, uh, you know, governments trying to understand how they deal with not only the pandemic, but all the, the uh, subconsequential aspects that have coming with it. But I think that uh, this, it creates a huge opportunity if not now, then when, to address some of these underlying and persistent gnarly problems that cities have been facing for so long. And this, at, at essence, is where um, I, you know, my choice to move, and I'm only two weeks in this role at, at Civic Action, to move from my job as uh, head of planning and development at Metrolinx, the Regional Transportation Authority, to an organization that I've known for quite some time, that is focused on catalyzing engagement towards more inclusive cities. Next. The, the, oops, went too far. So one of the things in my career that I've been very involved with has been bringing consensus around different sectors, different levels of government, around ways for it to solve issues and problems. They've, they've primarily been in the physical environment, so whether or not it was the work I did to bring the development industry together with different levels of government on setting in place a growth management plan to curb sprawl in our uh, in the greater golden horseshoe here or whether it was getting uh, elected representatives to agree upon uh, a transportation plan that would address comprehensively the need to expand public transit and the importance of that as part of our economy and a, a more sustainable and healthy future all of them were always the foundational piece of it was an understanding by those who had to be part of the solution that there was common purpose. And uh, I have many, many examples of uh, bringing people together, the importance of everyone hearing different perspectives and the transformative nature that that has, those conversations have in enabling us to move forward. So in, in my mind, um, and the work that is at hand ahead, because the problems that we are facing now are systemic, cannot be solved by one level of government, cannot be solved by one sector, cannot be approached as a sector only solution. Uh, it has to really focus on bringing uh, many minds together. Um, and uh, that's the only way I think we're gonna be able to accelerate the economy to really move in the right direction of, of finding social equity and um, moving towards 
the, the, the more, the very difficult uh, issue of racism, which is, it's not a, there, there are no quick fixes to any of these things. And in many respects, some of the solutions um, that we can address on issues of social equity can help address racism. The issues on economic recovery can ex address racism and all the way around that circle. And I'll talk about how uh, I see that explicitly next. So, uh, so to, to, for more emphasis, the importance of the dedication to collaboration, next. And the importance of not, uh, of exiting the echo chamber. Too often um, groups are, um, pat them, are, are talking amongst themselves, solving amongst themselves, patting their own shoulders amongst themselves and solving for one particular thing without really understanding the inadvertent consequences or they're sometimes setting back other issues. Next. So let's start with lever one, which is in my mind, one of the key elements of how, we're, how cities are going to have to face um, their way forward. And there's a quote here that I'll repeat again, which is around Jane Jacobs. And this is to the essence of what, why it's important to think about cities as being more inclusive ecosystems. Next. Let's start with uh, kind of what I would call, you know, access. If we think about it in a physical notion of access, how you physically uh, get around. Um, so I've spent the last 12 years uh, um, focusing very much on how to address issues of mobility. And it has, despite the fact we started in 2008 with a plan, it was called the Big Move. It was a very comprehensive, it required all, um, members of different um, levels of government to agree. And it led to significant investments at the first, uh, because of its consensus, because it had not only uh, elected representatives, it had the business sector involved, the environmental uh, community, labor, were all in support of the plan. It was able to garner investment from government, uh, first starting with a 9.6 billion. And by the time I left the organization this year, we were up to a $60 billion investment in public transit, unheard of in the history. Um, but it required an ongoing relationship building, and uh, thinking about things comprehensively, I, in other words, putting people at the center of mobility, not machines, and also ensuring that we were focused on choice. And so that as much as having more transit and more subway expansions and LRTs were important, it was equally important to look at the fare systems and the governance of them and how they were gonna work. So taking a more systemic approach. Next. The result uh, really, and what drove uh, the, our ability to sustain uh, this investment and attention to access was um, by delivering ongoing results and being able to expand the opportunity and constantly listening and attuning and being agile about what, is, what were the needs, not only uh, from a business standpoint of, of those that drive revenue, but also those that actually improve quality of life and improve uh, environment, environmental um, situation. And so what has now happened and, and over those 12 years of that, 13 years of that organization, what we were building in essence was public trust. Public trust on the ability to do the right thing because we have a plan and we were more or less sticking to it through all the ins and outs of, of political um, and electoral cycles that we recognized um, that we were um, uh, focused on the people who are moving, not only the ones that were our direct customers, because we have 11 transit authorities in transit agencies and transit operators in the region. And so ensuring that their voice was actually part and we were um, uh, ensuring to support each other in, in the way we were working. Um, but we were also um, uh, being able to show demonstrable progress in the work we were doing. So at the moment that the lockdown happened and the, the moment that everything that you know fell some would say fell apart, but fell into place um, with COVID. We were on we we were on a trajectory of expanding public transit by 30 uh, 30 percent um, in a three year period in the amount of service. From the first month uh, into the second month of COVID, we lost 90 percent. The organization lost 90 percent of its ridership. So a huge economic 
decline. And, and the organization took huge efforts then to start putting in all kinds of practices to, you know, on cleanliness and sanitation and, and, and spacing and markings in the stations. And the biggest barrier that has happened, and up until now, because uh, I think they're, I think they've built back about 30% of the ridership uh, is what we're back at. So no longer 10%, which is, which is good. It's an issue of public trust. And so uh, that has now been the biggest barrier to, um, to uh, helping those, especially right now, those who need to move around are in essential services. They are the most reliant on that. Next, shelter. So I think um, one of the interesting things around um, affordability of housing and the access to shelter even before um, uh, COVID hit and be, even before uh, we were addressing the issues of racism because there's racism within the uh, um, housing system and access to shelter. Um, there was, um, uh, the, the city was facing a, a bit of an affordable housing crisis. And two things uh, that I would say uh, when the, crisis, when the uh, lockdown hit have begun to happen. One, with fewer uh, people in the downtown area, um, the issue of homelessness was now becoming much more visible. Uh, for those that were able to go downtown, it's not necessarily that we had more homeless people, possibly yes, but now they were, it, you know, I, I know a lot of uh, my colleagues who did uh, were going into the office periodically would say, was, how come there's so much more, so many more homeless people all of a sudden? And it was like, they were always there. You just couldn't see them because there were so many people walking by them. Uh, and the second thing, this comment about the rise of the, the, the fact that, you know, this exodus to more affordable housing in the suburbs and outside, well, that has been happening. Uh, in many respects, I like to think of it more as the rise of the region. We are a multi-centered region. Toronto, of course, is the largest uh, hub, but we have large, uh, so medium-sized cities, Mississauga, Brampton, uh, Hamilton, that at the time of COVID were actually on the rise in terms of their ability to attract jobs and be less of uh, bedroom communities. And this is actually now enabling them to, to do more. Next. Finally, in the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the issue of uh, the physical access, uh, a whole new lens around public space. Uh, basically, the city of Toronto, it became very, very clear, we don't have enough open space in the urban areas. When people had to leave all those dense condominiums and especially those that, you know, the, 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 the value now of the dollar value of a condominium with a balcony just, you know, went out the roof. Uh, but even people having to go to parks and then maintain their distance and crowded, it became very, very clear. And now there's a whole larger effort, effort and it is the one thing that has accelerated, uh, you know, the introduction of bike lanes and the reutilization of spaces that primarily were not, uh, you know, this isn't that space that we're looking at there under the, the expressway was already there, but now even more utilized. And so now the city is looking at other spaces, underutilized spaces the growth and, and reuse of laneways. Uh, communities now um, um, you know, transforming their laneways into semi-public spaces for uh, small communities. So that has been a dramatic uh, shift as well, which I think will continue to be more permanent. Next. And then finally, the biggest and hard, uh, sort of largest, and I probably won't do it justice, is about access to jobs. And even before um, the ability of young people, um, people of color, um, racialized people, um, their ability and the barriers that they were facing, just in when you think about the pipeline of access into uh, jobs, uh, that was not well set. It became even more difficult. And I'll give you my small example. We have a partnership with LinkedIn where we work with young people, um, racialized youth, uh, on helping them uh, gain access and have a better uh, profile in terms of their CVs and how their presence on the LinkedIn platform. Um, when the lockdown hit, so there's quite, I think there, we have something like 800 young people we're working with. 80% of them 
had uh, challenges and issues and why was it not because well it was primarily because they were using public libraries as the mechanism to have access to a laptop a computer or the internet because in their home situation or wherever they were there was no internet or they didn't have the bandwidth or the one computer if there was a computer in the home was being used either for their siblings for schooling or their parent uh, was using it for work and they didn't have the capacity to do others. So there's a lot of things now that are become exaggerated. We're working now with the P Toronto Public Library System to see how we can help them in their efforts to kind of uh, find ways to better uh, reduce that digital divide. So employment and the future of employment, which was already for young people, for newcomers to Canada, uh, for um, racialized people difficult because of all the many barriers in the life cycle has become even more exaggerated and uh, at our organization at civic action we are about you know we're, we're in the midst of figuring out how to double down on this effort to uh, bring um, to enable us to put in place tools um, and measures to assist employers to leapfrog over um, all that was there before to uh, sort of do a bit of a reset for to help them go into a reset um, um, in that sense next so yes i think these are the two programs that i've been talking about uh, one is on the employer side helping employers uh, we have an ai tool we're working with employers to remove barriers to entry simple things like job descriptions and then um, with the youth next so the second value lever i'll talk about is inclusive leadership uh, next and uh, next. And so Toronto in particular has a, a great history of its ability to, um, in, you know, be activists in decision making. Uh, we are this, you know, uh, we were the, the, the community was very much up in arms back in the 60s we avoided a lot of the blockbusting that happened in the u.s because we had citizens uh, step up and um, prevent and were effective uh, through govern through their activism and in government uh, to be able to stop things um, and so we're really good at stopping things you might have heard how we were so diligently stopped um, work down on the waterfront uh, um, in the with working with um, Dan Doktoroff on uh, the, this, um, oh my goodness, the name is going to escape me now, not smart cities. Um, but uh, next, but I think we've evolved as an organized, as a, as a, as a city and a culture to have um, embraced a new innovative measures about to how to include others and better representation in decision making. This is a photograph um, of our residence reference panel uh, that was part of doing the planning exercise of when I was at Metrolinx on the 2041 plan for, for the region. The model is based on, and it's very much, um, I thank uh, Peter McLeod and Mass LLB for their work. It's based on the idea that if you could create what I, we, we refer to as a surrogate replica of what the region looks like um, by age, by demographic, by education level, by geography, uh, you, you could actually begin to have a more comprehensive understanding of a conversation of the challenges that we're facing in the future. In this case, it was the future of transportation uh, to uh, think about um, how you engage others. Um, so this is one method on top of many others. Next. But even more so, I think uh, when the pandemic hit at Civic Action, we immediately reached out to uh, all civic leaders and we have a very diverse network. Uh, there were 300 who joined us for um, a forum asking the question, we are sitting here now what is it that we should be paying attention to? And by that time, everything was virtual. So we were now beginning to do virtual workout, breakout groups. And how do we, uh, you know, the equivalent of the sticky tabs and post-it notes on issues and how do you have conversations in and around? And this group has now uh, created a bit of a task force. They came up with a range of specific topic areas. Interestingly enough, the one space, one of the spaces that um, was identified 
was about how we were going to continue to build public trust in our public agencies and in decision makers, decision makers and the systems that are there now. And so that's uh, one way that I think, uh, and one area where we, it's really important that off the bat, it's not relegated to certain uh, few to make the, to, to understand what is, where the solutions are going to come from. Next. Another area that we have been in the last 11 years actually uh, advancing is our diversity fellowship uh, program. Every year and for the last 11 years, we've been bringing in um, uh, a, a group of rising leaders, uh, young people who have expressed a commitment or, uh, or are able to articulate a commitment to engage in city civic decision making and being part of civil society and equipping them with the tools to know how to participate and how to be a stronger voice and leader. And we refer to it as our civic NBA because we focus very much on their leadership skills. We help them understand um, how civic, uh, how pub public dis decisions are made, what the structures are. So it's ag agnostic about issue, uh, but they bring passionate uh, desire and, and expertise in certain issues. And then we help them network both with amongst themselves, but with we uh, give them an opportunity to meet with existing and established leaders in the areas that they're interested in. Uh, we offer the opportunity for each of them over the course of the year, they're mentored. Um, it, it's a very high touch uh, kind of process in which to make sure that they're mentored with uh, someone that we feel is able to meet uh, both uh, their needs. And with the overall um, agenda for the fellowship at the end of the year, uh, you're able to uh, uh, enable yourself to know how you're going to affect change. And we've been successful through this program. Um, the graduates of our fellowship program have gone on to be elected members of parliament, city councillors, uh, CEOs on social enterprises, um, uh, uh, very effective leaders within private sector organizations because they come from private, not-for-profit, and the public sector. Next. Um, I'm going to skip over this one. I, I can always send this to you. This is a little bit about all the kind of touch points of what we work on with the fellows in the program. Next. And just spend a little time on this issue of inclusion. I think um, for Canada and for Toronto in particular, it's a very different situation about how we think about racism. I think historically, uh, Canadians have sat on the sidelines watching uh, and, and um, basically feeling comfortable with ourselves that racism is not an issue for us, that you know, we are a multicultural society and we are more tolerant and we understand how, um, how to live together and we're so inclusive. But that is not the truth or the fact. And in fact, um, uh, just recently, uh, we had uh, an incident, um, and there have been several, so this is not the first, a young woman um, uh, off, you know, off, the, off the balcony of her apartment uh, died uh, when the police entered her residence um, unwar you know, unwarranted. Uh, and it uh, really, uh, on the, around the time that the, the incident with George Floyd was happening, it really exposed a number of issues. Our, our private sector community has um, uh, made a, a call to uh, big business. Uh, we have uh, led by um, uh, the CEO from one of our large um, financial uh, organiza corporations to create the Black North Initiative, which has called on the private sector to make a pledge around its commitment. And then um, there is a, a parallel racism, not only around um, the black community, but far reaching and deeper and more painful with our indigenous communities. And all of these things now at this point in time, and I think are really very important, uh, next slide for us. Uh, but the first step is uh, there is an awakening as there has been in the US of a slightly different nature. But this little chart is some research we've just recently done with BCG, where um, at the time that we did it, which was just um, around the spring, frankly, 
80, and using um, existing secondary um, um, research. We did, this is not primary research. 83% um, of Black Canadians say uh, they believe Black people are treated unfairly and, and by converse, um, nearly half Canadians believe that discrimination against Black is no longer a problem. So um, I think part of what we are now putting our mind to, we've got collected a lot of data to uh, ins uh, 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 sort of ensure to the Canadian population and Toronto populations and the leaders in our community that in fact, uh, we do have a major issue at hand next and it's systemic. Uh, we have um, a sort of um, created and are uh, initiating uh, an initiative called Civic Match with young rising leaders, connecting them to established leaders and uh, making sure that there is a, these listening circles become a way of um, an exchange, the potential for mentorship and partnership to grow from these uh, conversations and enabling a young leaders access to networks that they might not have been able to have in the past. Next. So um, I'm towards the end of what I have to share with you and, and really what, this points to when we think about what is beyond this turbulent time that we're in is um, really the fact that we are going to need new models, new ways of uh, developing solutions to address these urban issues. Next. And um, there are a couple tips I have. So going back to my very first statement about the importance of common purpose. Common purpose is really the foundation upon which these systemic issues are going to need to be solved. Uh, it is going to require many perspectives and others, everyone to be able to see themselves in the way forward. Uh, that is the, so it's the counterpoint of, of, of you know, it's not about, ex, you know, we can't exclude, we have to make sure there's a way for everyone. That common purpose becomes the, the guiding vision or the North Star that the ways and means to how we get to it may vary. And, and they may be different and the paths for everyone may be different and how uh, the private sector moves forward. But if we all agree what we're trying, the outcome we're trying to get to uh, in terms of healing uh, the cities to a better future, then that's a, a really important step. It'll be very important because this is a marathon, not a sprint, uh, what we're gonna go through right now. And so it'll be important to celebrate early wins uh, in no matter how small, and the importance of listening uh, and, and learning before acting can is never been more important. I think you know as soon as a crisis arose, people have, have moved to act, and which is great. But what we want to guard against is what I refer to as ra random acts of kindness. Next slide. So what got us here won't get us there, and nobody can do it alone. Next slide. So universality. Uh, this is my second tip about anyone thinking or, or, or in the city building space. Um, we need to figure out how to put the most vulnerable that face the most barriers as a litmus test for our decision making. Because in many respects, if we solve for those issues, we solve for many more. And um, we need to be thinking not only how we solve for today, but how what we're doing is, is kind of on the right track to what uh, subsequent generations are, are going to face. And, and finally, um, oftentimes we make decisions uh, that create efficiencies that are sometimes at the price of effectiveness. And what, but what I mean by that is we create a solution for an immediate problem and then we think, okay, we've solved it. So we'll just do it times a hundred. Um, and it's not, not every time does that work. And not only that, when you become so comfortable with your success and you become so efficient and the, and the results is, are so well established, you kind of pat yourself on the your shoulder and you don't ever re-examine uh, its applicability in other places. And I've seen that where successful organizations, you know, their customer satisfaction is off the charts and so they just sit back and then they kind of replicate, replicate, replicate. Meanwhile, their customer base is changing, the environment is moving, and that solution is now, in fact, it's not, not only is it not relevant, it's also, also uh, to a certain degree detrimental to the organization. Next. So can't copy and paste. What got us here won't get us there. 
And um, uh, it's clear that these gaps that we are facing now require new and different ways of looking at the same problem. Next. And finally, um, this is also you know, a difficult time for those of us who believe that facts are one of the key uh, ways to help us make smart decisions. And you know, the twisting of facts and the decline of the uh, place and the notion that someone should ha can have an expertise, and that is a valid thing, um, is, is very much in question. And so you know, as a bit of a policy wonk and, and, and a, a believer that facts and information are one of the most impactful ways to um, uh, ensure that um, we make, we guide ourselves well, um, it is important not only to fa have the facts to, to understand and know how we do good analysis, but the biggest uh, in, in piece and the gap that we always get lost at is the ability to translate the data and facts and to communicate them well and effectively to multiple audiences. Um, and I think in, in a convincing way. And, um, and I think the other thing is often um, um, ensuring that we have good discipline around not just quantitative data, but qualitative data, and, and making sure that we acknowledge that things like oral history are as valuable as spreadsheets, testimonials, and uh, personal stories, uh, that they are facts. Uh, they are um, lived experiences. They are part of uh, what enables us to make good decisions. And then I think as well, continually, uh, continuing to understand how technology and automation can be tools to assist us in this way forward, but continuing to also remember they're not the end in itself and they are means. Next. And then I guess my final tip, which is not a tip, is, um, the glass half full. It is imp uh, so. My career has been actually constantly uh, driven by my belief that, uh, uh, in my positive belief, that there are ways out of every gnarly, wicked problem. And in fact, if anything, turbulence creates great opportunity. It basically uh, um, moves existing systems and structure structure into disarray, which gives you the opportunity to rebuild in new ways. And so whether you are a half full or a full full, um, it, it is an important part, at least in my profession and my career, it has been as a, your ability to continue in what sometimes seems like uh, overwhelming and untenable problems because systemic problems, which are urban problems, are not uh, for the faint of heart. Um, final slide, and uh, I think I will stop there and open up for questions or conversation. Thanks so much, Leslie, for that wonderful talk. I invite everyone to turn on your videos if you're so comfortable doing so, um, because now we're going to engage in conversation with one another and it would be nice to see uh, nice for Leslie also to see your faces when she's talking with you. Um, Leslie, I had a question to start off, and I think Suzanne does also. Um, of the many different crises that we're dealing with, one of them is going to be the fiscal crisis at the national. Maybe it's slightly better in Canada, given that you are not in such a basket case um, with COVID, and therefore the economy doesn't have to stop quite the way that ours might. But uh, certainly in, in the U.S. context, the fiscal situation is quite terrible, especially at the state level and at local levels, and therefore the aid that can be imagined to come may, may not, particularly given the kind of gridlock at the federal level. So oftentimes when cities are able to exact um, benefit benefits for communities it's when the economy is going well and the developers and the builders and real estate want to locate there and so you can uh, push for a lot of things and so in this moment where we have simultaneously a push for more equity inclusiveness and justice and also economies in many cities are tanking how do you see um, cities rallying around being able to prioritize the vulnerable in this moment when they might just say let's make this bid it out for the maximum best use whoever wants to invest here whoever wants to build whatever no restrictions so i think 
Oops, am I on? Yeah. I, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Um, I think, so first of all, uh, 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 trying to uh, solve the economic problem and trying to solve the issues of the more vulnerable, they, you need to think about them as not mutually exclusive. And, and back to the, the, the point I was making about um, it's going to take all energy, so it's just at the scale of the city, let's say, perhaps or at the scale of the urban region. Maybe that's the more powerful thing if you're, in, if you're a small city in a large area. The role of getting um, the, the municipalities to actually agree that together, so not just city one by itself, going to kind of uh, make the cry city one, city two, city three, um, trying to pool their resources at the scale of an urban economic region, um, bringing together um, having the private sector by sector or by, um, you know, um, place uh, those that have uh, and, and certain um, uh, portions of the private economy are doing well, some are less, and, um, and the not-for-profit to actually say that we can't allow um, this kind of randomness of you know first to the post around uh, you know you know where the where, wherever um, stimulus fund funding is coming we can't allow that we need to actually prioritize and we need to figure out in the short term where is the most effective way that collectively we think uh, is 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 needed and where is it that um, in the medium term we need to get to because what that will allow is a degree of patience to endure. If, we, if there is a coalition around, this is, we're gonna do this together, um, it will, we, you will be in a better place. And so I would say, you know, for any city that's struggling and economically, I mean, in Toronto, is, it, it's deeply struggling, um, but it is looking to see how it can uh, best uh, work with the private sector and the boards of trade around um, uh, finding the solutions. There is not gonna be an easy, easy way forward. And it's not, for some place, in some places, it's not gonna happen right away. But at a minimum, if you're able to all kind of come together and agree, uh, you, know, you know, just every man, woman, and child for themselves, is, going to, is not gonna help anybody. Because guess what? We're not gonna basically tap into a labor force or the full strength of our labor force. We will be leaving talent behind that can be part of our new economy or getting the economy back up. So I think um, uh, that is, I mean, this is a hard question, but I, I think that's where I, you know, I would start. Bringing, you know, how, how can we, like, everyone look at each other in the eyeball to eyeball. Do you really think that if you solve your problem, it's, it's everything else is gonna go away? It, it won't, so. Hopefully that helps. I don't know. Suzanne? Yeah, Leslie, thank you again for your talk. I, I wanted to uh, draw upon your, your long uh, career as chief planning officer at Metrolinx <clears throat> and, and also the incredible amount of investment that's been made in public transportation in the Toronto area and the complexities to to uh, to uh, to that, you know, crossing boundaries and just the, the 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 sheer population in the area of Toronto. And I particularly wanted to understand a little better how you addressed issues of equity and inclusion in the decision making around that investment. Um, you know, both in in transit modes and in the areas of the city that that it reached, and how you. Um, how you balance those decisions or, or in particular you know ways that you went about doing that <clears throat> well the first thing i'd say is i'm not sure we did it very well off the bat so um you know we started off uh, in the plan talking about um uh, that a plan that was built on the three pillars of sustainability, um, strong uh, pros prosperity, a strong economy, a healthy environment, and a uh, high quality of life. And, um, and to be frank, we didn't necessarily, when we thought we were building our plan on the basis of issues of growth and where was growth happening? Uh, and we sort of physically laid out the plan for, for where transit was going to be invested on the basis of where we saw growth, by growth meaning population and jobs happening and how we were going to connect these communities across the whole region. 
and and to be frank when we started we there was a kind of a ode there was a map that we had that sort of uh, uh, was ge sort of geospatially located um, the socioeconomic composition of the region at the time. And we sort of, to a certain degree, at the, you know, so this is 2008, comforted ourselves that what we had put on that map wasn't so bad. Because uh, interestingly enough, um, you know, where populations gathered, that's actually where some of the higher need was existing anyways. So that was, you know, 2008 first blush. Um, and probably, um, you know, about four or five years later, there was a lot of critique about our ability to actually address issues of equity. And partly when we started in 2008, we frankly didn't even have enough data to begin to dissect those big lumps in the way that, you know, I'm talking about different um, communities, um, you know, the indigenous communities, it's communities, it's not a monolith, gender, you know, and women, it's not a monolith. And so we have a lot more now and a heightened ability uh, to do that. So when we went to the 2041 plan, which was the next generation of the plan, there was a larger attention to issues of equity. And um, where we started to focus was sort of fine tuning the plan itself in terms of where the investments were happening. Some were already committed so and, and on, on their way, so those held. We were looking and we took two, there were two places where we made some modification. We hadn't spent as much time focusing on um, uh, busts as a mode. Uh, we were very focused on the interregional larger infrastructure pieces. Uh, in the second plan, there was a whole uh, effort on high order bus um, service and frequency and more frequent that was able to permeate more areas. And then we sort of mapped that against the high need communities and, and uh, made a proposal to have emphasis there. And that's uh, what they're working on now. The second was around fares. Um, and and uh, there was no fair integration. So if you had a job at one end of the region to another end, you were literally going through three transit operators and paying three fares. And which in, in the end, most people, there would be a huge barrier. So we sat down with the 11 transit operators and have begun because we now had the smart card technology that was in place um, to begin to design a system uh, that was more that made that was more F A a more fair fair system, and that uh, we were we would use all the tools that we had at hand uh, to address through concessions or the fair structure itself to begin to bring uh, make public transit more accessible. So that's my examples. So it's a journey. I don't think we're there. It's definitely not there, and I, I hope it'll continue to evolve. All right, guys, now's your chance. <laughs> Opening it up for Q&A. Well, and I'll ask another one since while we're waiting for the students. Leslie, I'm I, I- randomly calling on people. <laughs> oh no. That's, uh, <laughs> that's in my back They're being shy today. It's a cold uh, first day kind of winter feeling. But Leslie, I have another question for you. So I, um, uh, um, I'll just mention the first time uh, I encountered Leslie was she was a, um, a judge for the ULI Heinz competition when our team in 2018 uh, won the whole thing. Leslie has a background in architecture, which you didn't mention at all, um, in planning. And I guess it was just a little interesting for us, or interested for our students here, primarily planners, but may have come from design backgrounds of how you've integrated your um, your architecture background or your design background and how you think about cities and the work that you've done, which is, you know, decidedly, you know, away from the traditional, traditional architecture path. Yeah, I get asked this question, did, you, did I plan it this way? Uh, no. Um, so two things I would say about um, architecture. So in everything I do and every day, up until this day, even in this role, um, the thing that the architectural um, my architectural education and and because I did practice for a while um, right after graduation for a, um, I was a, um, a, an, a member of the Ontario Association of Architects had my stamp did the whole thing um, worked in an office um, the one thing that to this day I take with me is uh, what now is you know um, uh, sort of people refer to as design thinking 
um, is how I think through and how I solution and how I think about strategy is very much in that same vein about, you know, from concept, how you iterate a design, um, who you iterate it with, how you solution, how you, the ability to communicate and articulate. I'm a very visual person. So um, when I'm presenting to my board or for, uh, it's less words um, um, and more visuals. The second thing that was, uh, you know, one of my uh, proudest achievements at Metrolinx is transportation is a very engineer driven um, uh, um, um, sector and, and no no offense to the engineers in the room but the engineering and my daughter's an engineer so I can say say this um, it's a fairly linear um, uh, pet, you know way of learning uh, in engineering and it's very kind of black and white there's answers there's finite answers you calculate and there's a solution an architect is not like that architecture is not like that or at all in fact there are many there are many solutions to a problem uh, that manifest themselves in architecture. Um, so in 2013, um, uh, we, I began the journey to establish a design excellence team within the organization and began to move the organization to understand that the quality of the space we were creating actually had a value that was directly related to our customer experience and our customer satisfaction. And in fact, um, so we built it, we had one person start. Uh, we, you know, a lot of procurements were going out with no eye to what the quality, the design quality was. And, and that was another thing we had to change and, and put in the organization, uh, the language of design. Because if we said design with an engineer, they had a different sense of what that meant to when we were using the term design. I remember having to introduce the concept or the notion that we needed a design narrative. And I remember, the, you know, everybody in the room just almost um, blanking over, not knowing what it was. And, and now every um, project has a design brief and a design narrative. And now we have uh, explicit roles and that we changed the, change the weighting of the procurements around design excellence and quality having a higher weighting than simply budget um, or experience. And so I'm, that is uh, one way. Um, and, you know, you know, why did I get into architecture was for impact. I wanted to, you know, in Trinidad, you know, the reason I went into architecture, other than my mother saying it would be a good thing to do, was um, I would drive by um, every morning to go to school, uh, large shanty towns. And so what I wanted to do when I wanted to study architecture was to do housing for poor people. Um, and um, uh, part of why I left architecture is because I wasn't feeling, I was very removed from customers, clients in, in the work I was doing, even though I was doing institutional work. And I felt I wanted to be in a place uh, where I was uh, more at the center of decision making. And, and I wanted to be in the room where it happened. And uh, so gradually that's my career has been around that. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, we have a couple questions now coming into the chat. Everybody keep them coming. And I'm going to ask uh, those of you who are asking them to go ahead and ask it in person. Ian, you want to start? Sure. Um, thank you, Leslie, for your talk. You mentioned Black North and the private public um, agreements to making pledges for racial justice and equity. I was just wondering how effective do you think those are? What are your feelings on these pledges? Um, this week, we've been studying community economic development in our planning class, and we actually had a professor from the University of Toronto come and speak to us about different approaches that cities take, localist, transformative, or extractive. And um, in terms of that type of relationship, since Toronto is a booming town, it sounds like with all your all the cranes happening in the center, do you think do you think pledges are enough? No, pledges are not enough. It's like, it's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, we should have a one black person on the executive committee. It's not enough. That being said, it's an important step forward. Uh, the most important thing is the accountability. So, um, so I think, um, uh, I think what Black North is doing is, um, is, 
is important. Uh, they are taking a great approach. Uh, the proof will be in the pudding in terms of the ability of the organizations who have signed the pledge. Our, we, we are, uh, you know, our organization has signed that pledge to follow through and to follow through with real action um, and not just check boxes. So a pledge is, is a good start. It's not, it's not, but it should not be your fi final step. Hain, you wanna ask your question? Yes, thank you, Linda. Um, I was gonna ask about like regarding like, the Paris near transit project. I'm, I love transit and that's definitely something I want to be studying in my time at Cornell. And uh, you were talking about how the fares originally, like if somebody had to go across town, that would be three different transit companies in Paris. I come from the DC area where we already have an integration. And if you are going across the region, you know, it's, you can pay a solid price. So I was wondering how were those companies accepted? Did they find it like, kind of challenging for them, like not economically you know, efficient or what were their thoughts on it? So I think that the interesting thing about fares is, um, so maybe step back. So all these um, fare oper these uh, transit operators um, came into being at different times. Uh, they are all primarily uh, run by their city council. So they're either like a commission and, and so they have these independent decision making. And uh, historically, so over time, some are newer, some are older, they've just made independent decisions all the way through. And so um, the fact that they're not integrated has, is, is, is one of the biggest challenges. But the thing um, that um, has been um, the, the difficulty when we, bring, when, we, when we were bringing them together, in order to solve the issue of fair integration, when you have these many players with existing um, sort of balance sheets of how they're operating, um, and, and by the way, most transit you know, smaller transit operators, their return on the fare box is like between 30 and 40% normally. So there's a great subsidy coming from the, um, from, the, uh, from the municipality. When you move to whether it's a fare by zone, fare by distance, you know, one, you know, however you move to it, there's a recalibration when you take this comprehensive approach that happens. And the first reaction from any operator is, okay, well, who's going, if I'm gonna lose money, who's gonna offset? So you need to tell me off the bat how we're gonna make this work financially. And one of the biggest challenges by, to, by the, uh, to the point of common purpose, the first thing we had to get to uh, with all those groups is, okay, if we put aside the how we're gonna, figure this out financially. Do we all agree that it will be better for the customer who doesn't actually care when he crosses a boundary, just need to get from A to B, that it will be better for us all in all in the long run? And then once people said that, then it was, okay, well, let's, let's try to work on what would be the solution and then figure out how we're going to, because if, if we go together as a cabal to any level of government, to anywhere, that we all agree this is what would be better, then we can figure out how we together can figure out how to deal with the issues of the subsidy and, and offsets and, and pooling the money or not pooling the money. And because that has been um, over and above, you know, should it, all, all the different analysis that you have to do of deciding which is better, which is worse, how you deal with concessions, all that stuff. That has been consistently uh, the issue. And when things get a little rough, that's what people fall back on. Well, I don't have enough money. And then we have to remind them, okay, the common purpose and the reason we want to do it is, and then we can keep going. But that's been the biggest, that's been always the ongoing challenge. Because also because they're accountable to not to a regional transportation authority, they're accountable to a different, uh, they have a different governance structure, which is another one of the issues. Petrus? Yeah, hi, Leslie. Thank, thanks for talking this morning. Uh, so interestingly, I just moved over from Toronto uh, to, oh. to Cornell this year. So uh, thank you for the great work that you've done for, for, for the city of Toronto. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what are some of the considerations that Metrolinx has taken into, into place uh, when it comes to addressing uh, the current fiscal deficit that is likely to happen with the transportation systems? I mean, I know that the TTC and the and the goal systems are already not not um, operating at a profit, even in a pre-COVID situation. So I was wondering whether there were any considerations to try to inc sorry to try to reduce that deficit through, um, let's say, like 
a way of like developing the stations or uh, like in like in the same way that that uh for example Hong Kong has done that because I know that at least from my own uh when I was at when I was at the University of Toronto uh, many of the professors and a lot of the speakers that came in they were talking about how like uh Metrolinx and the TTC could kind of uh work together to create a similar situation yeah thank you so first of all, I'm going to preface what I'm saying by saying I'm no longer at Metrolink, so uh, I can't speak to what is current because um, I, I left there at the end of August. But I will say that, you know, the organization has uh, over the last three to four years been undergoing a whole kind of um, what I would call uh, examination of effectiveness. They've gone to a number of ways to kind of streamline their processes, improve their ability to deliver service, which by virtue of that actually makes them well set up um, uh, for um, uh, sort of being right-sized for the situation. Now, not losing 90% of your ridership is a dramatic, dramatic situation. And you know, it's not even clear if, uh, uh, so it, it'll be very difficult for the organization to come out of this themselves alone. So I'm, I'm sure um, government will have to be part of helping uh, the way through. But but I will say that, you know, just before I was leaving and at the time when the pandemic hit, the organization went into a whole series of business improvement plans across the organization and basically went into the organization and said, okay, now is the time. If ever there was an idea that you thought was going to help us improve, no matter how small, uh, whatever it is and, and whatever piece uh, in operations in construction in planning and communications, bring it forward. And it actually became an opportunity that, in, you know, to help uh, um, everyone um, uh, and to help the budget and to help figure out. So everyone became far more vested in ensuring that. Um, but I, it, these are, I mean, I, I think, you know, the problems that we're going the financial problems are going to be ones that I don't think Metrolinx can solve necessarily on its own. The good news is on the construction side, that kept going. The lockdown did not affect construction. The construction sites didn't have to be shut down. So that was able to keep going on the capital side. Uh, it was really the operating side that has been the most uh, challenging. And I think that's true for all transit operators, not just in Toronto, but I think across North America and probably Europe is, and the rest of the world as well. Thank you. Jesse? Yes, I just want to say again, thank you for coming, Leslie. Um, so I want to look at what you said earlier. We spoke on if you look at disadvantaged communities and if you really can solve their issues there, you can probably solve them elsewhere. You know, same issues, but it's really potent in these areas. Well, I wanted to know how you felt about smart cities. I know you brought it up earlier, but I really want to see how it works with inequality, job opportunities, and overall livelihood of those people. And uh, if you see any more potential growth for in terms of architecture, I know you had something for engineers, but I feel like this could be a planning architecture uh, issue as well. <laughs> So I guess it's uh, maybe you can help me a little bit in terms of when you define or use the term smart city, what you mean, because I think there's smart cities just based on technology. Uh, that's one umbrella, but may, just so I make sure I answer your question correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know for a fact that there's many different versions of smart cities and definitions. So I would say maybe looking at transportation is one, uh, connection or connectivity to online services, uh, how you work on your parking or tr uh, transit system for the civic side. Uh, I think even uh, in terms of how you play into the sewage or your clean energy really takes part. So I guess technology. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. You know, it's interesting. Um, uh, there, the I don't know why I can't remember the Dan Doctoroff uh, project that was right here on the waterfront. I apologize. It just, Sidewalk Labs. Thank you, Sidewalk <laughs> Labs. It just escaped my mind. So um, there was an initiative um, uh, on our waterfront, uh, really uh, stretching the limits of the concept of a smart city, uh, Sidewalk Labs. And what was interesting is um, to, to, to get to your point about vulnerability communities 
the center of it was more on the emphasis on technology and solving issues of what I would call convenience uh, for urban living um, uh, and uh, you know, uh, environmental um, issues of smaller carbon footprint, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, for, there were all different pushbacks uh, on that project, but as in reflection, as you've asked that question, um, it, it's interesting that that group never thought about how that technology could fix, you know, use it as a lab to fix one of the biggest issues we have right now, which is our, our, um, our housing supply by the Toronto Community Housing Corporation. They're the ones that supply um, uh, subsidized housing, their, their um, asset class, you know, all their, uh, their assets are in huge disrepair. And when, to me, that's like a huge opportunity to re-retrofit, refit, and introduce new technologies uh, that would benefit a sector of our society that has now has been neglected. And th that connection never really happened. Um, we never, as a community and, you know, Waterfront Toronto, we never really made that connection because th to me, that was uh, an area um, that really um, we should be pursuing. And so is there a connection between smart cities and uh, those that are most vulnerable over and above anything net new? I mean, the ability for um, developers or government to go into their existing assets and just re- think them we did we have a, a, a history of being able to do that uh, here you know we have the tower block project uh, that the city did which was the ret, you know retrofit of old uh, 60s um, uh, apartment towers to be more energy uh, conservative you know to conserve more energy um, in that space uh, you know a, a more kind of what I call rudimentary way of doing it but really positive so um, you know back to my original tip, if you th if if the vulnerable communities are at the front and center of where you're thinking that you're solving for, no matter what you're doing, you're trying to not only think about how you apply that solution to uh, what you have right in front of you, but its ability to actually address uh, the broader issue. So I so yes, uh, but it requires a mindset that recognizes that actually the purpose of doing the smart city is not only for what uh, the developers would call your core market, but you have actually have uh, the ability to utilize uh, the technology and the expertise to address other parts of, of the community and the society of which you are part. And it's linked to uh, private sector's um, uh, need to really acknowledge from a social uh, um, corporate social responsibility standpoint, the multiple uh, applications of what they're delivering. Thank you. Yadi. Uh, hi, Leslie. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. And I'm sorry, I can't open my camera. It's a uh, technical thing. Uh, so it's I, okay. um, uh, I'm on. I'm wondering how uh, economic develop and equity engage each, each other uh, because uh, sometimes there are contradiction between equity and economic. Uh, one thing is uh, some people may think the uh, inequity lead to difference and the uh, difference will uh, intensify the circulation of, cap of capital. And also, uh, you know, there are I think it's very hard to make people rich at the same time. There are always some people get rich first and uh, other one later. And also in planning, there are uh, you know special uh, economic developed zone or district, and there are some some place there are capital intensive area. So I wonder, uh, do you think in planning there are contradiction between equity and economic growth? I would say. Um Yes, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I think, let me give an example of transit-oriented development. So there's public investment happening in public transit. Um, one of the things I uh, just finished doing just before I left Metrolinx was setting up within the organization uh, a new line of business around development and uh, working with the development community on station locations and development in around, um, in around stations. 
So let me, let me just start, because there's a double-edged sword to what I'm going to uh, talk about. So in thinking about uh, what kind of partnerships and what value the organization wanted to extract out of the public investment through development and in partnerships with developers, we made sure to talk about value extraction. And value can come in many different ways. It can come in cash. It could come in subsidies for affordable housing. It could come in uh, open space. And so we wanted, so, so we looked at transit-oriented development in that way, about how we could derive from, from uh, the, the, the already public investment and partnering with the private investment, because the private sector would themselves be investing it well, to net-net come out ahead for everybody in that sense. So that's a, a, a underway. You know, there'll be varying degrees of, of success in that. It requires collaboration with the municipalities. If we're going to have inclusion, inclusionary zoning, if the city is going to set up um, policies around minimum uh, number or percentage of affordable housing units, as they do in uh, London, Transport for London does that. The the to your point about this kind of um, disparity. The challenge that we would have to guard against and need to guard against is the more that you, transit-oriented development actually, back to this notion of cities create wealth. It, it creates value as well for those around. So not only is it uh, meet the properties around. So um, this is where we get into land value capture. But the moment a station arrives, not only would the transportation authority be able to extract value, uh, beyond just the capital dollars in the in the transit and their partner track, but everybody within a 500 meters of that uh, station uh, begins to um, their their properties are going up, their, their their wealth is increasing, and then the whole uh, challenge of gentrification and pushing out of the uh, affordable shelter for for many. One of the things that has been in discussion, and, and I think in some cities in the U.S. this is in place, where you create um, zones around, um, around these uh, transit nodes and uh, you create uh, mechanisms, uh, more than just a development charge that goes back into the public purse, but you have deliberate measures around how the value that is created and being able to calculate that uh, uh, within that kind of um, echo of, of the station and how it goes back into the community or to address issues within that community spe specific, you know, around equity issues, whether it's around um, investment in daycare or uh, public facilities like libraries or more open space or programming. Um, I think those, that's the way and the, the way to actually bridge the equity issue against um, issues of economic development. Because yes, there's many, many examples of uh, gentrification in and around uh, public investment uh, where not everybody is benefiting um, at all. Um, it, it's, it's difficult un unless we're in a, a socialist communist society, it, the wealth will never always be completely equal. Um, uh, but the benefits should be fair and equitable. All right. I think that Paola and I have um, interlinked questions. I'll ask mine first, and then I'll ask Paola to ask hers. Um, Toronto is also quite famous for the regionalism that has emerged over the past several decades, including the amalgamation of six municipalities in the center of the city. That was in an article I read written in the 2000s. Uh, that was seen as a kind of, um, in the words of then mayor, a kind of uh, suburban ambush of the inner city autonomy in order to privilege the greater um, number and forces of the suburbs to control what was happening in Toronto. So I was wondering if you could speak to, you know, given your experience as a planner in transportation networks that is linking the downtown with the suburban regions, how you see this issue of equity when it's encompassing not only say downtown communities who are affected by gentrification versus development, but the broader spatial notion of equity uh, encompassing the suburbs. Paula? So, Sorry, I'm gonna ask no, no. Paula to ask her. Okay. Hi, Leslie, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, so you talked about coordination between different levels of government. 
around the common purpose. So in these scenarios, how can we manage the resistance that, that arises from political difference? So I think that maybe this resistance might start even recognizing uh, existing issues uh, and identifying that common purpose. For example, recognizing racism in, in some context might be difficult. That was my, my question, thank you. Okay, um, so uh, off the bat, I'm gonna declare that I'm a regionalist. So I'm a big believer that actually economies are fairly, re and it's from my experience in Toronto, it's not, it doesn't apply everywhere. So um, um, having though, you know, I've worked for a mayor uh, sit, sitting at city hall, I understand uh, the dynamic between the large cities, the suburban centers, the emerging urban areas. But to kind of, get to, to the question, so, so I'm going to try and make sure that I got Linda, 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 is it you're asking, how is it that you, that, that, that lens can kind of move forward? So I kind of lost track of your first question, the first question. <laughs> Do you mind just the short version of, of the first question? I apologize. I, I don't know if I have a very clear question, so you're, you're right to ask. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm trying to ask how you see, you know, your conversation is a lot about equity and transportation and there's, how does a spatial and political differences between the suburbs, the exurbs and the downtown play into that notion of equity and fairness? So maybe I can answer the question by giving a little bit of a story. You know, how did we get um, I don't know, there were like seven mayors, three, two regional chairs, you know, including the mayor of Toronto, who, you know, Toronto is like, you know, the gorilla in the room all the time. How did we get them to agree that there was one way forward? Okay. So, you know, money is a great motivator. And what the real, the, what all those le leaders realized, and this was around infrastructure at the time, um, they were all going to, you know, the Ontario government or the national government, all, um, you know, uh, making the case for why their municipality uh, should get whatever pot of money was there for their project. And smartly enough, uh, through an organization, because the Association of Municipalities of Ontario and the Federation of Canu Canadian Municipalities, they were also meeting uh, and, and sharing with each other and acknowledging that basically they were competing with each other, right? They were competing for a finite amount of money that they needed to address a whole range of issues, infrastructure, social services, all that stuff. And uh, they were, a few of them sort of were smart enough, well, I shouldn't call them smart, you know, they, they realized and it was, you know, it was, it's more leadership than smarts to be frank that we would be better if we actually all ourselves agree on what it should be. And uh, with the acknowledgement that I won't, not all of us will be first in line, but the commitment that the whole piece that we're putting forward would be committed to, then it's okay. Um, and uh, so that was one of the foundations of how the region started to actually come together. It was that. It was also the fact um, on the transit space, the public, you know, we had reached, like congestion was just getting out of control and the public was asking for a solution. And so you, if you're a mayor in small town, wherever, Burlington or um, uh, Markham, you know that the solution, you know, you have many residents who are working in the downtown Toronto, living out. You see that you, you want to attract more investment to your city and you can't do it without a network. And you know, in order for to get an investment to your small place, you need to have the rest of the region or at least the bigger ones who are asking to agree that that actually would help both of you. So there's mutual benefit. A lot of those things were the foundation of how to get the leadership in, the, in our region to come together. And then over time, as they continue to have these conversations around gridlock, around issues of the environment, and you know, of course the environment is a whole ecosystem and you can't, you know, it, everything's connected to everything. And so you do something in the Northern part of the region, it, it, it's immediately impacting down on the waterfront. Uh, they began to really appreciate their interconnectivity as an economy, as an ecosystem, as a social system. 
uh, that now, you know, and I have this little diagram I do about, you know, in the past, there was this binary uh, travel uh, pattern from the downtown to the outside, from the out. As the region has grown, that map doesn't look radial. It's like a web. And people are living, working, playing all across the region. And I think those leaders recognize that the degree of interdependence. So while Toronto was the biggest city, you know, they, it's, think of it, about it like a body. It's the heart. And you can't do without it. At the same time, all the little artery cities around realized, uh, that Toronto realized that it actually uh, because supply chains were not always in the downtown Toronto, that uh, uh, people that are working in downtown were not, they didn't only live in Toronto. And that this, this um, interdependence uh, helped them realize that, they, that, guess what, we are a region, we may not have acknowledged that, and, and that uh, was the foundation of, of getting, the play, getting to where we got on a number of things. Amalgamation, if I could take it back to, because there was a question about amalgamation, which was a subset. It was actually seven cities uh, that were by decree of the provincial government uh, required, forced, forced to amalgamate, met with a lot more resistance because it didn't have that plateau of let, let's, um, we're going to talk about why this is beneficial. Now, you know, in, in fact, truth and in fact, would, would any of them of any of those seven mayors ever agreed that they were better off together? Um, possibly not. So that was, you know, collaboration and cooperation and consensus doesn't work every single time. And then someone has to sometimes come in and push. And then that's where you see a much more resistance happening. But I don't know if any of you have worked in large organizations. I've worked in places where we've done organizational transformations. And the successful ones are the ones where the staff and the whole organization believes the change and transformation is necessary for us to move forward. The ones that never happen where there's resistance and you can't get that uh, org chart to work as the CEO is the ones where nobody actually understands why you would even need to change anything or believe there's a reason for the change. And I think you know, that fundamentally speaks to uh, how and why a region can be uh, more successful uh, or not. And a lot of it is, it is about this concept of leadership and an appreciation for and hearing firsthand from each other um, uh, uh, and empathy to what each other is doing and trying to find a way for, for mutual success. I don't know if I answered the next second question now that I'm finished blathering on here. Paula, did I, did did I you, get Paula? Uh, yeah, like my question was exactly about like political differences, but I guess. Yes. I, yeah. Okay. All right. So that, does that help? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions that the audience would like to ask? All right, then I will ask my final question. And um, I hope you don't mind that I'll take it towards a more personal reflexive turn. You've spoken a lot, Leslie, about leadership and the power of individual agency and change within the structures of society that we have. And you've attended a number of um, educational training type things at Harvard uh, Business School and um, University of Toronto on leadership, leadership for women in business and those kinds of things. I wondered if you could speak to your personal experiences as a woman of Chinese descent uh, operating in a, in a different country and your own, um, what, the, what your, how your identity has played into the kinds of disadvantage or advantage or privilege that has afforded you struggles that you've had in a personal way with equity and voice and participation um, and what you would then say to students who are aspiring one day to lead what leadership means and what you would suggest that they focus and think on while they're in school thanks for the question and, and you know in order to answer the question it's sort of important for me to kind of talk about you know what made me who i am because in everyone's uh, way of leading is going to be different and so I grew up in a very matriarchal uh, environment. Uh, you know, very strong women uh, were my role models growing up, my grandmother, my mother. Um, and also uh, 
you know, very um, resourceful women. Uh, always, uh, you know, if you grow up in a place like Trinidad, where, you know, at least one week every month, there's no electricity and no water, and you have to be prepared for all kinds of things, and you want, you know, you want to, uh, you know, have, have uh, beautiful things and have a life, you become very resourceful. So I had the advantage of really good female role models in my life from a very early age. And, um, and then I had the second advantage, which you know, at, at a certain point in my life became less of an advantage, which is a society that actually is very comfortable speaking its mind. Uh, so in Trinidad uh, and, 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 and being, um, and, and not um, taking quote unquote personal offense to criticism or critiques. And, you know, you could add architecture to that learning as well, because, you know, we learn how uh, the concept of constructive criticism and how to take it and, and, and deal with it. Um, so those are some of the things that I carry forward with me and have carried forward with me um, in how I lead. And, and then I think the third thing is, you know, my dad was one of the most meticulous, industrious people I've ever met, just kind of get her done kind of person. So I've always been uh, a kind of um, outcome oriented. And um, so, but when I left uh, Trinidad to come to Canada, uh, to to um, to study, it was a, you know it was my first seismic shock uh, culturally um, climate wise, um, and uh, it was my first test of my own resilience and an understanding of myself. Um, I wrote about this recently in a little blog in my blog. Um, so Trinidad is a British colony. We study. Um, uh, or a Cambridge O and A levels. My entire life, I was of the belief that I was a good subject of the Queen, spoke her her mother tongue, and I arrived here in at the University of Waterloo, and I had to repeat everything I said. Um, uh, it was my accent was now what had been part of my most uh, useful tool in communicating and dealing with issues uh, was now uh, a barrier for me, and. Um, I did what, uh, I'm not, you know, in tears to my mother called and she said, you know, you know how to speak Spanish and French, just learn Canadian. I'm, I paid for your fees. You're not coming back because I was like, I meant to come home. Um, and uh, so I immediately adopted Canadian as my second language and I began to speak the way I speak now. And, um, and I basically, I, you know, only now in reflection, I realize I did what many refer to as code switching. So I gave up part of who I am and, and, and to a certain degree to be, to be able to fit in. And I think um, in hindsight, a lot of uh, what I have been doing up until very, you know, up until, you know, say about 10 years ago is code switching, trying to adapt and adjust uh, to be able to navigate sometimes a lot of things that were unknown to me unknown climate, unknown culture, um, and uh, my ability to bring my true authentic self back to the table has, has been uh, enabled only really when I began to realize how um, to, to build my own self-awareness. So I was fortunate to be receive a fellowship for the International Women's Forum, which enabled me to do a lot of these programs, which helped me do two things get a lot more data to understand the um, the biases that women have to um, that women encounter and in particular intersectional women like myself in the workplace and the stats and the data to to help me you know I talked about Canadians coming to terms with the fact that there is reason to help me understand that actually <laughs> I, I've been navigating this way very focused on my outcomes and my projects but I with the times where I'm not doing as well is because I'm facing barriers and that I have to now acknowledge uh, and, 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 and overcome and so that self-awareness helped me actually trying to solution my, you know, my, myself and figure out how is it that I can still um, be myself, lead uh, in the environment, and, and be more conscious and deliberate about how I do it. I think up until then, I was probably doing it in a more intuitive way. And so self-awareness has been one of the key drivers of my ability 
to really be a, a more effective leader. The second thing I would say is the moment I moved from thinking about the, what my, uh, you know, my project, my outcome, to actually thinking that the outcome is actually a means to enable others to, uh, uh, to grow. And so that is when I moved to more of a coaching mentality um, uh, about my work. And then, and also always uh, when I began to think more about sort of middle of my career about what is gonna be my legacy? What am I gonna leave behind? What, you know, and the what then led to not just what project, but how am I going to um, uh, pay it forward, so to speak, of the benefits that I've been able to achieve and what I have learned to enable others to do the same or better. And so my commitment to always um, leaving things better than the way I found it, expecting, and I always used to say, expecting that one day I will be working for the people who worked for me, um, has been part of the shift in my ability to um, to uh, Im improve my leadership and it's a work in progress. I'm constantly doing it. I think the other thing it enabled me to do and it's been so fulfilling and part of why I moved from Metrolink to civic action is to then sort of spend a lot of time with particularly with uh, young women, uh, young professional women and um, learning from them and them learning from me, uh, spotlighting them and sponsoring them in so far as enabling them to have uh, it through introductions or ways that, uh, to have uh, to move up in their careers that has been a really satisfying uh, role as a leader for me that is you know it's not just about the KPIs or the outcomes or the balance sheet of your out of, of your output in an office or a workplace it is all these other pieces that um, and people uh, that you're able to bring along with you or to nurture and to grow. That's the other balance sheet that I, I now pay a lot more attention to. Is that kind of, did I ca ca uh, touch on all, all these things? I mean, I, I also have the benefit of um, uh, personal advisory board. So it's a group of other women in different industries who are my trusted circle. And, you, you know, back to my example, you can't do it alone. I can't be the leader I am by myself. It, it um, Eventually, I own it. I own my own career, but um, I, I I have learned how to ask for help. I have learned how to say no a lot better. I've known. I know. I've learned. You know, it's interesting. As I don't know if this is just women or just I, I, I'm not sure what it is, but it wasn't until after that IW fellowship that was the first time ever. I mean, I've been through a whole career. I had my own business. I had worked in you know for ministers and stuff was the first time after that fellowship, was the first time I ever went to my boss and said, this is the salary I deserve. I never had the, I don't, the ability to think that I actually should ask. Um, I just assumed that I would be rewarded and that it was a, merit, you know, a meritocracy. And if I worked really, really hard, everyone would see how great I am and I would be rewarded as anybody else who was doing equal to what I was. And I realized that actually it didn't work like that, unfortunately. So, you know, all these things uh, uh, help you move in a direction. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's still, still moving. Thank you so much, Leslie, for taking time to be with us and to share all of your insights from your professional work and your personal history. I think it gives a lot of us uh, younger junior professionals and students and faculty a lot to think about in our, our work and how we um, engage each other and engage the work that we do. So let's unmute ourselves and thank Leslie. Thank you. Thank also, you. Also. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank really you. enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Take, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.